Hey guys, welcome to another of my pool plan videos. In these videos, I will cover my thoughts and opinions on upcoming banners in the next arc. In this case, it will be the arc featuring Seymour as the featured character. You can refer to the cropped infographic on the left hand side of the slide to see which events these are. The infographic was derived from the World Authors Global Forecast and I will also include a link in the video description to the full forecast in case you are interested. Before starting off in Seymour's arc, let's take a quick look on the previous arc which was Seed Rain's FRBT arc to see how I did. The first event featured the release of Seed Rain's FR and BT and I went in deep with tickets hoping to score his BT. I actually got his first FR within like 200 something tickets or so but uh, I went in even deeper hoping to get more dupes for the FR to save on the high power stones and of course hoping to also score the BT along the way. And finally at 550 tickets I scored 2 FRs in total and Seed Rain's burst weapon so I decided to cut my losses right there. Pretty happy overall because getting the BT weapon in 550 tickets to me is uh, quite a good result. The next event after that was Anna Crow and I skipped her banner because I already have all her weapons up to her LD and I don't really have any interest in Anna Crow's FR weapon. It's actually quite a decent FR weapon because it comes with a HP damage cap up 50% when you do elemental weakness which is quite huge with Anna Crow because her Omega God uh, represents multiplied stats uh, with her so the 50% damage cap up is actually uh, pretty huge with her. In any case, coming to the next banner which was Lilyset's event, I went in with tickets here only actually aiming for Lilyset's uh, LD weapon and I was actually quite lucky on this event I have to say because uh, it came with the first free multi and on the first free multi I actually scored Lilyset's FR so I decided to then go in with tickets uh, for her LD which I was still missing and I got her LD in 30 tickets so um, based on that I decided to just cut my pulls there. I actually don't really have a lot of Jagran's kit but uh, to me I, I don't really have any interest spending tickets or gems chasing after Jagran. So that's it for that arc. In total I pulled on 2 banners only and I spent 580 tickets uh, overall. So coming to the start of Seymour's arc and the first event here will be Dimensions End Transcendence Tier 12. There's going to be two banners here. The first banner will feature Seymour, Guy and King and both Seymour and Guy will receive a rework. The second banner will feature Prish, Fang and Trey with uh, Seymour's FR weapon also on that banner. Now first off about Seymour, he will receive a rework as mentioned. The rework is centered mostly on his damage to bring it uh, up to par in the current meta. So his S1, S2 and EX damage is buffed. He also comes with more ability users in his S1 and S2. And his trademark generic debuffs which are the attack down, defense down and uh, max brave down all get stronger in terms of uh, potencies. Seymour himself gets a new BT weapon and his BT aura fits in with his overall theme of his uh, character which is it gets stronger based on the enemy's remaining health. How it works is that his BT aura actually has 3 levels or you could say 3 stacks and the stacks increases in number each time uh, the enemy hits a certain HP threshold. So when the enemy's HP is above 80% it's still at the first level. It levels up with another stack once the enemy's HP drops below 80% and finally it levels up one more time when the enemy's HP drops below 50%. Depending on what level it is, you get varying potencies of attack, defense and speed down auras on the enemies and you get buffs on uh, your side of the party with uh, stolen overflow, brave increases Brave damage cap up, HP damage cap up with the highest potencies obviously at the highest level. At 3 stacks, so when the enemy's HP is below 50%, in addition to all of that, your attacks will also always dispel 
one buff from the enemy you are targeting. Seymour's new FR weapon released on this event, once used will dispel all enemies buff and will inflict his trademark 6 turns of attack, defense and max breakdown debuffs. His force time also follows the theme of his character which is you get more bonus depending on the enemy's health. So when you attack an enemy during his force time, as long as the enemy has no buffs, you'll get plus 40%. And that should be relatively easy to meet considering that his FR already dispels all enemy buffs, his LD also dispels all enemy buffs, and if you have his PT aura at 3 stacks, you will continuously dispel one buff each time you attack an enemy, so it shouldn't be hard to ensure that you meet the first conditional. The next two conditionals are based off the enemy HP. So when you attack an enemy and they have less than 80% HP, you get a plus 10%. And if they are below 50%, you get a further 10%. So in total, during CMOS force time, at most, you can get plus 60%. Which isn't too bad on paper, but the issue really is that a lot of his kit is based off enemies' HP. His base kit already requires the enemies to be at certain health uh, in order for him to trigger his consecutive or follow-up attacks. And with his BT Aura and his Force Time Conditional also following the same theme, I have to say that Seymour is a very clunky character to use, which is a shame because I really like his animations. His uh, BT is actually going to feature Anima. To get the most out of Seymour, you really want the enemies to be below 50%. So the issue really is that if, if you are main partying Seymour until that point in the fight, you are going to sort of have to carry a very lackluster character because uh, especially at above 80% health of the enemy his kit is extremely terrible even support characters will probably do more damage than him and it wouldn't be so bad if you know if the payoff was worth it but in this case you know plus 60% force time for example isn't terribly exciting at this point of the meta, you have characters that can do at least that much, if not more. Same goes for the BT auras as well. I guess having the utility of being able to dispel one buff at maximum stacks is kinda nice, but you know there's so many ways that you can actually dispel buffs at this point of the game that you don't really have to depend on someone who requires the enemies to be at 50% health to do so. In terms of damage potential, I think it's the same thing as well. He does do pretty nice damage once the enemies drop below 50% health in account for all the uh, attacks that he does and all the HP dumps that it represents. But even then, you know, it's maybe on par with some of the harder hitting characters that you already have, such as Tifa or Renoa or Reigns. And so the question is, you know, why, why do you then want to bring Seymour and have to go through the pain of bringing the enemy's health to 50% uh, in order to trigger all his additional attacks when you can just bring one of the other options and be able to do all of that right from the start of the fight. There is one note though that I have to say that uh, even if you don't plan to pull for his FR or BT, his LD call ability is actually pretty good and I would actually recommend to at least consider picking up his LD if you have not have it yet. His LD call, once used, will delay all enemies by 2 turns, will dispel all enemies' buffs, will apply his framed debuff that carries the HP damage up, and will also debuff the enemies with attack, defense, and max brave down. That is quite a lot considering that it comes from just one LD call ability. I also want to briefly shout out about Precious LD which is available on the second banner. Prish LD call ability is also a pretty good call, but I'll cover that more at a later part of the video. One final note, Fang and Guy on these two banners will also receive rework, but I won't go through into so much detail there because from what I can tell, a lot of their rework just focuses on updating their attacks so that the damage is more in par with the current meta. Their base kit otherwise remains largely the same. If I interpret it correctly, I think Fang's rework also allows uh, 
her EX to delay all enemies by one turn, so that's uh, at least something. Now my plans on this banner is to actually skip both these banners. That's because I already do have Seamoss LD and Precious LD, and I don't really have any interest in Seamoss FR or Burst Weapon, so I'm just gonna make do with that. And even if there are ticket missions, I'm fairly confident that I will be able to make do just with Seymour up to his LD. The next event is Maria's Intersecting Wheels. In my opinion, when Maria's LD first made its debut, she was really an underappreciated character. Her LD trap was really quite good back in the day. Of course, in the current meta, there are many other options for often damage and traps, so she doesn't stand out as much as she used to. She does get a rework on this event, where her LD trap now lasts 10 turns which is very welcome and this greatly increases the longevity of her kit because her main attraction really is her LD trap. The rest of her kit is, uh, I, I should say, doesn't really stand out because many other characters can do roughly the same thing bar her LD trap. On top of that, her LD trap also will be updated in terms of damage and it now does double HP dumps instead of the 1 HP dump that you used to before. And that's actually quite attractive because often damage uh, being at 2 HP dumps is still relatively rare. There are some characters that has it, but not a lot. The rest of her kit also features a rework to boost her damage up to the current meta, but not forgetting that uh, her button presses that doesn't actually deal too much damage. Uh, because you do have to take into consideration that she does often damage on top of her on turn damage as well. Along with her rework, Maria will also get a new force weapon. Once used, her force attack will heal the entire party and will inflict 10 turns of her trademark LD trap. Her force conditionals are pretty unique in that whenever you heal any player unit, you get a 2% increase per character heal. So if you heal the entire party, that will be a plus 6%. Anytime the enemy ends their turn at 0 brave or in break status, you will get a plus 20%. And it shouldn't be that hard meeting this conditional considering uh, her traps. And finally, during any player turn, if you heal the player party, you get a 5% per character heal. So that would be 15% if you heal all 3 characters. Now Maria's FR isn't really plug and play in the sense that you do have to build around her FR if, if you want to get the most out of it. And that's because 2 out of her 3 conditionals are centered around healing. So ideally what you want to do if you are using Maria's FR is to have the other 2 characters with the ability to also heal the entire party. Her Final Fantasy 2 allies are actually great examples such as Firion, Leon, or Minwu. All those characters feature traps as well, and all of their traps actually heal the entire party. You could also con consider characters such as Celeste, who also uh, has traps that will heal the entire party as well. So for example, if you have Celeste traps up, Minwu's traps up, as well as Maria's traps up, uh, and all three characters are in the party, each time the enemy acts, they will trigger all 3 traps. You will heal plus 6% per trap, so that's 18% in total. And you will get also 20% at the end of the enemy's turn from the second conditional. So in an ideal situation, that represents 38% increase per enemy turn, which is pretty decent. However, at this point of the game, Maria is not the only often FR available. And if you've been playing over the last few months, you probably already would have access to other often FRs such as Kor, or Celeste, or Minwu. Maria's traps doesn't really work well with a lot of the tanks. Maybe I guess Celeste would be the only exception. But if you consider other tanks like Oren or Gadolus or Galuf for example, they don't really feature party wide heals, so they can't make use of the rest of her force conditionals. And another big drawback about Maria's FR is that it does require 3 party members because if you are using anything less than 3 party members, you aren't going to make full use of the heal per character conditionals. 
If properly built around though, Maria's FR can be very devastating and you can see potentially very high force bonus percentages. So all in all, I would say that if you are lacking often FRs, then Maria's FR is probably a good pickup. But if you are already comfortable with your current roster of often FRs, then you aren't really missing much if you decide to skip this banner. My plan here is actually to skip this banner. I don't really have a lot of interest in Maria's FR. I do feel quite comfortable with my current roster of often FRs already. And in many cases, if I want to often uh, damage the boss, I would normally use a tank uh, combined with uh, core. And for that setup, I don't think you know I really want Maria's FR to be in play. I could potentially use Maria up to her LD. I do have that, and so you know if I already put in Maria for LD, then I will probably just make use of another FR character. One final note: Cedar also will receive a rework on this event, but his rework is focused on updating his kit to include more HP dumps. Looks like he will get one additional HP dumps across most of his attack, so his damage is uh, boosted after the rework, but his kit otherwise largely remains the same. Final event on this arc will be the Heretic event, featuring Yuna's rework as well as a newly released FR and a rerun of her burst weapon. With Yuna's rework, Velofor's attacks now has 5 HP dumps, and in case you're wondering which are Velofor's attacks, those would be her modified uh, Brave and HP attack after her EX has been used. That is actually pretty good for a support unit, I have to say. 5 HP dumps is certainly nothing to scoff at at this point of the game. Sure, of course, there are DPS characters that can do way more than that, but Yuna is not a DPS character, she's a support character. And not forgetting that those attacks come off uh, her Brave and HP attacks and not actually an actual skill use. Her LD buff now comes with more support auras than it did before, which boosts Yuna's uh, aura bot support capabilities. And with a rework, Asuna is now an instant turn as long as you equip the Asuna Light passive. That is pretty handy to have, that means that Yuna can now effectively be used as a force gauge charger if you wish to do so, or you can also pass her turn without increasing the turn count just by removing the Asuna light if you also wish to do so that way. With her new uh, FR weapon, Yuna's force attack will now cleanse all party debuffs when used. Her force effects firstly requires you to end your turn with no debuffs on your party, which should be always the case with Yuna in your party, and you get 20% with that. Not forgetting also that Yuna's auras are dependent on your party having no debuffs up, so if you are planning to include Yuna in your main party, that should always be your priority anyway. Secondly, on Yuna's turn itself, if you end her turn with no debuffs on your party, you get a further 20%, so that's 20% plus 20%, for a total of 40%. And if you use any converted Brave or HP attack, and this would include Velofor's attacks on Yuna, or I should say Velofor's converted Brave and HP attacks on Yuna, it will be plus 40%. Overall, for Yuna herself, that is actually pretty good, considering mainly because Yuna has access to a BT weapon. So, for example, you could do something like go uh, BT plus, uh, FR, and then BT mode with Yuna. And during all of Yuna's turns in her BT mode, you can use her Sonic Wings or the other Velofor attack, which I can't remember the name now. But in other words, the Brave or HP attacks. And you will trigger all three conditionals when you do so. And you get 80% increase per turn inside her BT mode. Which is, you know, nothing to scoff at. Her, her entire BT mode and force time will then do pretty decent damage overall. That being said, her force attack isn't really plug and play, mainly because of the third conditional where it carries a juicy 40% requires you to use a converted Brave or HP attack. Not many characters have a converted Brave or HP attack that you would want to press. While it does take into consideration even like Brave Plus or HP Plus attacks, 
when you are in force time you obviously want to use skills that do a lot of damage and not do like a HP plus 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 attack so you do want to use her with characters such as maybe Makina with his furious blades burst attack or maybe Shalota with a chuck stuff for uh, as an example but you know if you have another party member such as maybe Anna Crow in your party you obviously don't want to press Anna Crow's HP plus attack on her turn you normally want to do her EX or her LD this is to me actually out of this arc the event or the banner that I'm mostly having the highest dilemma on I actually do really like Yuna I think she's a great aura bot support character and having the flexibility of also doing some very nice damage in her BT mode and force time mode is a good bonus for me and on top of that I do already have her LD and her BT weapon as well although her BT is not green to me though I think after some thinking I would most likely skip these banners as well for one thing I don't really feel like I want to spend BT ingots because I am quite low on those and Jack Garland is coming up for another thing I am also pretty comfortable with my support characters most of the time I will be either using Luna Freya and Hope because of the extra utility that they have anyway or maybe someone like Selfie to make all the enemies launchable which would then mean that it is more challenging to then find space to actually fit in Yuna in the first place if you do lack support characters then I would highly recommend to consider at least picking Yuna up she is a very competent uh, support character if you combine you know, her LD support auras as well as a BT aura as well on this part of the video I'll be covering my opinions and again I can't stress that enough it's really only an opinion on what I think you should focus on if you are limited in resources which could be gems or tickets or maybe even ingots on your end I normally split this across two categories nowadays which are characters that I think will give you good value regardless of who you already have built in your roster and the second category is what I call as role fulfillment characters which are characters that may have potential value but it largely depends on who else you already have built on your roster now in case you are wondering why the graphics appear on the slide as such uh, firstly in terms of the good value I do place Seymour and Prish there but as you can see uh, really only their LD call abilities I really think both Seymour LD call and Prish LD call are calls that will probably uh, be used across many different fights at least in the foreseeable future and you know even if you want to skip their FRs or BTs you should at least maybe consider picking up their LDs to get access to their LD calls Seymour I've already mentioned the call his call utility um, during his, the segment on his banner so what I'll do here is talk a little bit about Prish LD call which frankly I think many people underestimate Prish LD call gives the caller two turns of a very very juicy breath damage plus 50 percent hp damage plus 40 percent plus 20 percent breath stolen overflow which by itself are already one of the best self caller stats that you can have in a call ability but what many people don't actually realize is that when you use fish ld call you also get the ability for the caller to double brave hits done and I have to emphasize that this is not brave damage it does not double the brave damage it doubles the brave hits so for example if you have the caller use an attack that normally has maybe two brave hits into an HP dump the caller now does four brave hits before doing the HP dump now this is a very unique call ability to have and in the current meta is actually extremely valuable especially since we are sort of in the middle of the elemental lockout uh, events it combos extremely well with the kid safe ld call so what you want to do is have another party member hold the kid safe ld call and use it and in your main damage dealing characters turn so for example your tifa or your anacro or your uh, seed reigns 
have them use the bridge LD call. Now, the Kate Sif LD call will allow you to get an additional brave gain anytime you do a brave hit. And as I mentioned, the Preach LD call doubles the brave hit. So, coming back to the example where if you normally do two brave hits before the HP dump, if you have both the Kate Sif and the Preach LD call aura up, what will happen is that the character will do four brave hits as opposed to the two. And across all four of the brave hits, you also get brave gains as well, a la the Kate Sif LD call. And this allows you to actually very easily cap out your uh, your brief uh, each time you do your attacks even if your attacks are resisted by the elemental lockouts so it's actually a good way to get around it and i think one good application here would be anna crow because she was recently released her attacks will carry the holy and dark elemental uh, to it and if they are locked out you know she'll be doing very bad brief damage and her, her HP damage as a result will suffer significantly but if you have the Kit Sif and Preach LD call you actually get around that and you can still output very significant damage with your Anna Crow in that circumstance Moving on to the role fulfillment category I only place Maria and Yuna here They are actually pretty good characters Maria would shine a lot if you build a party around her focusing on often damage that also heals the entire party and if you feel that you want to round off your roster with an often damage dealer, uh, then Maria is actually a good pickup. Yuna is a very capable aura bot support character with the added utility to dispel debuffs. So if you find you're lacking support characters, then she is definitely worthwhile to consider. So this brings me to the end of this video. In summary, I will probably be skipping everything. I may change my mind come Yuna's banner depending on my ticket situation because I am actually still having problems claiming tickets from hunt events and co-op shops because I'm capped out but let's see I'm hoping to actually save all of those tickets until Jack Garland's event if they can last until then Anyway, thanks a lot for watching I hope this video has been helpful and if you enjoy the content do leave a like, comment or subscribe because it really helps a lot Till then, I'll see you guys in the next pool plan video. Bye!